Okay, hi. All right, we can start now. Sorry for the uh, slight delay. Uh, very good morning. Welcome. Welcome to Estra Awani's uh, webinar. It's called Link. And I'm really excited today to have three uh, very distinguished panel in the logistics and supply chain uh, industry joining us today. Our topic is moving logistics into a new world order. This is a one hour discussion. We will also have a session for Q&A. Uh, we'll give it about 15 minutes at the end of the session. Before we begin, I'd just like to go through some of the hygiene points during uh, this discussion. Now, we recommend that you shut down other video and audio tabs to clear up your bandwidth for a better experience. And should you experience any technical difficulties, you may exit the room and use the same link provided to rejoin at any time. And we may also be running polls during the session, so please feel free to participate via the tabs on the screen. Now, if there is a major glitch uh, experienced by you guys, we may reset the entire system. But when we do that, please just sit back, relax, and you will take into a new room automatically. And finally, um, we will be, like I said earlier, answering some, uh, taking some questions in the chat room. So if you do have a question to ask our speakers, just put your remarks into this question box. I think it's on the right, uh, below our right. And we will flash it up during the Q&A at the end of the session. All right, so those are the hygiene points and we'd like to get straight to our discussion. Once again, a very good morning, welcome. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce our three panel on this session today. That's what Michael Teo, he is the CEO and MD of PKT Logistics Group. Now, PKT offers a full spectrum of logistics supply solution uh, in Malaysia, from warehousing to packaging to transportation and distribution services. Azim Halim, welcome. He's the country head of Ninja Van Malaysia. Ninja Van is, of course, one of the fastest growing last mile logistics company in this region, spanning across six countries in Southeast Asia with over 1,000 hubs, and they employ over 20,000 people. Last but not least, Dato Abdul Raza Abdul Malik. He is the president of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, CILT. CILT is an international professional body for everyone who works in supply chain, logistics, and transport, and they have over 35,000 members in 36 countries. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for taking time to be part of this discussion. And um, the reason why we are doing this topic really is because we saw firsthand during the uh, pandemic how e-commerce players, logistics provider, last mile delivery providers became so critical as frontliners during this pandemic to get fresh food, groceries, medical supplies delivered to millions of people stuck at home. In Malaysia, now the closure of businesses and services uh, following the movement control order MCO in March has really vastly uh, impacted how businesses operate and supply chain logistics is one of those areas that were most affected, especially in the initial days of the MCO. And it has helped companies scrambling for ways to keep operations running smoothly while keeping employees safe from the threat of COVID-19. So now that we are in mid-July, economies have opened up, but it has opened up to quite a different world and consumer behavior has also changed. Expectations from consumers have changed too. So how are logistic players adapting to this change? That is what we will be discussing today. First, um, I would like to kick off this conversation by having a, a quick look uh, at the health of businesses now. So I'd like to get straight to the business owners, business manager, which is Dr. Michael Teo and Azim. Uh, maybe I'll start with Azim first, right? How has your business recovered since the MCO, which was in mid-March? Well, um, you know, thanks, Cynthia, for having me here today. So I think, well, <clears throat> well, being in the courier industry, courier is considered to be a essential service. So we were never, we were, we didn't really shut down at any point in time. But instead, that uh, we were faced with multiple challenges, like especially during the start of the MCO. So during the start of the MCO, what, what we saw happen was uh, the number of parcel deliveries actually dipped by quite a bit, given that there was a lot of fear in the market. People weren't sure what was happening. You know, they were panic buying a lot of things, uh, uh, but more uh, panic buying a lot of um, food and toilet paper and things like this, right? But then what you find after that is that actually the market grew to a level that's much higher than what it was previously. 
right? Because uh, a lot of the retail outlets were closed, a lot of the malls were closed, so people look to the online. People look to online platforms like likes of Lazada, Zalora, and Shopee, of whom which we service, and uh, they move their buying habits from offline to online. So actually, while we saw initial dip in parcel deliveries during the start of MCO, we saw that uh, the number of deliveries in Malaysia grow to maybe uh, two times what it was before the MCO. So actually, business, um, you know, it's it's been we've had to manage the growth quite well, uh, and but together with that growth, it also also came a lot of challenges. Mm -hmm. So with the MCO, I'm sure you're aware that operating hours were uh, limited. Yep. Uh, there was also uh, the cancellation of flights, which limited our deliveries to East Malaysia. Uh, being an essential service, we were expected to work, which means that any changes in SOPs for social distancing, uh, any changes for delivery SOPs to um, uh, to ensure the safety of our consumers and customers and recipients, all those have to be implemented very, very quickly. So it really, uh, MCO for us was really a double-edged sword. So double issue was in the sense that uh, demand have increased, but at the same time, it uh, was a challenge for a company to pivot quickly to keep up with the increased or surge in demand. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and um, uh, MCO was it also happened during the time of Ramadan, for example. So we had limiting limited delivery hours. We had more parcels to deliver, limited uh, shorter delivery windows, and then combine that together with uh, Ramadan as well as Hari Raya, where we had to lose a few additional hours uh, to allow operational staff to break fast, for example. And then on top of that, the spike, the further spike in deliveries for Baju Raya, uh, and as well as Hari Raya Essentials. So it re really was a double-edged sword, to say. OK. Now, I'd like to get to Dr. Michael, too. Now, in Malaysia, the most difficult period of this pandemic, like I said earlier, was the early days of the MCO. A lot of uncertainties and disruption to supply chain and logistics. That's First right. of all, have your has your business recovered for PKT Logistics, and how did you adapt to the disruption in supply chain, especially uh, from China, where we are very reliant upon? Okay, hi, right, uh, Cindy, uh, and uh, everyone. Um, basically, if you look at the macro view, um, the last uh, crisis that we faced is uh, 2009 World Financial Crisis. And before that, it was the Fukushima earthquake uh, that uh, caused a big disruption in the logistics supply chain. Uh, because PKT is a specialist in automotive logistics. So when the Fukushima earthquake happened, uh, the supply, uh, just in time supply into the production plant in Japan uh, was disrupted, uh, where the component couldn't supply to the plant. As a result, they cannot produce car components to be manufactured all over the world. So that was disrupted. And then the Japanese changed their concept from uh, just in time to dual sourcing. So they started dual sourcing one in Japan and another one in China, not knowing that China will have a coronavirus that will have a lockdown, instructed their supply of components from China to Japan. And without the component supply from China, and then you know that China become a world uh, component supplier, about 60% of the uh, market share of the world component suppliers to the whole world. So because China couldn't supply components to the whole world and every one of the car plant actually shut down. Uh, if you read the news coming out in uh, March, uh, the, the started with Hyundai because it's near to China. They depend a lot of components from China. Hyundai shut down. Then PSA, which is Peugeot Citroen also shut down. And one by one, all the Mazda car also shut down the plant because they couldn't get component. As a result, they cannot supply the component to uh, uh, Malaysia for us to manufacture into the car. So because of that, the, there will be a big change, uh, as my prediction will uh, say, that they're going to do dual sourcing in Asia uh, instead of only focusing on uh, China as their main component supplier. In the near future, the, the manufacturers, is not near future, is already start moving, making their move now where they're going to supply their components from ASEAN as well. So they will be dual sourcing uh, not only uh, outside from Japan to, to China, but it's China to Malaysia as well. So because of the disruption in these um, supplies, uh, obviously, uh, uh, automotive industry have a, a big uh, impact, lah, okay? Because uh, one of the items is uh, a luxury car is not uh, essential. So when there was a lockdown, then um, uh, happened. Uh, we were lucky 
uh, that we have essential uh, customers as well. Uh, because in back in 2009, uh, PKT has a diversification, uh, uh, this is diversification plan. Uh, we did a, a company transformation where we came up with three Wawasan. So the first Wawasan that we came up from 2009 is Wawasan 6040. Don't depend all your eggs in the automotive logistics basket. So basically we diversified 60% remain in auto, 40 in non-auto. So within the 40 in non-auto sector, we have a few verticals that we are focusing. One is uh, FMB, one is FMCG, fast moving consumer goods, which both of them are essential items as well. And of course, we also went into education and other items. So with these three Wawasan, uh, it actually uh, helps us to cushion the impact of uh, zero sales from automotive logistics. So we still have 40% sales, luckily. La. But uh, I still remember from the day when uh, the government announced uh, the lockdown on the 18th of March. So we did, we had to address our employee because they are all very worried because we do not know what's going to happen. So for us, we need to get permission from the, in order for us to operate, all our customers need to get permission from the MITI uh, for us to operate. So that letter from the customer to get from MITI takes time as well, but they are essential items. So uh, some are questionable whether they are fall into essential or non-essential right. items. So in that case, they need to get permission from uh, MITI for approval. So there's a lot of scrambling, uh, what to do and what uh, uh, and, and whatnot. Lah. So in terms of operation, uh, for this essential item, then we have SOP. And then the SOP is changing along the way. Uh, and we also do not know how to adapt to it. Uh, they need us to reduce our uh, numbers by 50%. So meaning we have to change the whole uh, uh, operation of the, the warehouse. Because if normal capacity is 300 employees, you reduce it to 150, means I have to reduce the, the, product, uh, the, the method of uh, picking and packing and delivery. So uh, SOP needs to be changed as well. And then we have this motivation issue with uh, the staff who come to work because you can imagine the rest of the staff like the accounting staff, administration staff, they are all at home, safe with their family. Whereas for those staff that work in the warehouse for essential items, they had to come to work. So how do we cope with the motivation for them to come to work? So we have no choice. We impose this call, uh, uh, what do you call that? Um, uh, uh, some levy uh, extra charges uh, to give to them uh, for them hardship we call it hardship allowance so right. we give them hardship allowance of 50 ringgit for whole day and uh, 25 ringgit for half a day because why uh, it's not uh, it's like a compensation for them because the whole family are not going to school the children are not going to school somebody need to baby babysit them and then the the parents have to come to work so these are hardship allowance that we had to give out so you can imagine the sales drop and we had to pay extra to motivate them to come back to work so that our operation are not disrupted as well so, so many companies were forced to make difficult decisions including retrenching employees and salary cuts did you have to make those concessions well, yes, we did uh, thought about it, whether we need to uh, actually uh, cut their pay or not, because we are applying for UPA. So in the terms and conditions of applying for UPA, you cannot uh, retrench your employee for, for the six months. So um, uh, I, I, we decided we are going to apply for UPA. But uh, one thing that we change is uh, we, uh, in, we come up with a scheme called Voluntary Salary Deferment Program. Okay. Now, this is acceptable because why? They volunteer to defer their salary for three months. So the month of uh, April, May, and June, uh, our staff actually volunteer uh, up to about 30% of their salary to be deferred, to be paid from uh, October onward back again because we predicted October, our operation will be back to normal. So that is where we will start paying them back the salary that we defer uh, for three months from April, May and June. So that is what we did. I'd like to get back to Azim for uh, a quick uh, minute here to just understand how quickly did you guys adapt it? And did you also have to make tough choices, including letting go of some of your staff? Well, we were very fortunate to um, be in a position where we didn't, that wasn't even a consideration for us. 
uh, given the rise in the in parcel deliveries meant that we didn't have to let anyone go during this very, very difficult time. Um, but with regards to speed of deployment of changes, it really was uh, during the start of MCO, I don't think uh, the team took any Sundays, took any weekends off. It was really a constant grind to constantly develop new products, new SOPs, uh, both on, on both on shipper facing side as well as consumer facing side. I mean, one example is um, our contactless delivery program, which is instead, I mean, typically as a, when a parcel is delivered by a courier, you have to get a signature. Uh, it could be on the phone or on airway bill, but how do you do that when right. you're not allowed to be within one meter of anyone? So instead, what we did was we quickly developed a tech product that enabled us uh, to build a in-app photo taking. So instead of getting a signature, we would take a photo of the parcel in the hands, sorry, uh, in front of the customer's house or in the hands of the customer, which will then uh, uh, become the proof of delivery. So this is just one example. Okay, I would like to bring Dato Abdul Razak in now. Uh, as Zayman, Dato Michael, we'll come back to you shortly. Uh, Dato, Dato, can you hear me? Sure, sure, yeah. Okay, Dato, we see that uh, globally trade volumes were dragged down by disruption to production and logistics, and imports also uh, fell. In your opinion, have we passed the lowest point? That's what Michael said that he's expecting recovery in October. What are your thoughts? Okay. Um, Assalamualaikum and a very uh, pleasant day, everyone. Oh, Thank you, Estrawani, uh, for inviting me to be in this webinar. I'm truly honored. Now, let me answer your questions. Um, in the last three years, especially when there, are, there have been significant check in global trade, like US-China trade war, Brexit, etc., you can see that globalization is, you know, in the brink of collapse. But whether it is collapse or not uh, is, again, another, you know, kind of the wheel of fortune that will all be around. But uh, let me tell you here, there definitely uh, it is not, at the end of the world because uh, a lot of things that uh, technology has uh, overtaken although we might see that one day the actual traditional supply chain chain would have uh, you know uh, end up uh, because of uh, disruption of uh, technology and all that but uh, i can see that uh, the idea uh, of uh, political uh, inclination uh, and, and uh, anti-globalization has come up and then coming to the pandemic uh, of COVID-19. Uh, there are a lot of uh, issues actually and questions that we are not answering it. For instance, like, uh, is there a new normal actually? Is there a new normal? Uh, whether it is, uh, you know, whether IT and automation has lead the way for us to do things. But if you look at Ninja, Ninja was doing it very well. But uh, whether it is going to be towards the death of the supply chain as we know it, we do not know because uh, destructive technology is coming in and all that. And then uh, perhaps I see that uh, if we keep on doing trainings for, for our people and adopting, uh, you know, opportunities from the crisis and all that, possibly we will be surviving. Now, uh, this question are beginning to see a shape, but it is still too early in the crisis uh, to think that we are now seeing answers as to what the new normals look like, okay? Economics in Asia, for example, thing to recover, but we know that there's remain great risk of epidemic uh, returning again. And then decision will continue to be taken on a short-term basis and decision taken will tend to be reactive and short-term rather than plan that, and invest heavily in the future. Therefore, there may be some changes in sourcing, but this will be tactically based and will be unlike to need long-term decision and involve capital and large investment. So at least for a year, decision need three to five year investment horizon or no or longer will be put out until the health risk subsides and the financial risk remains as the economies in the decline. So meaning to say, it is so uncertain, but at the same time, that technology has helped you know, us you know, to survive as it is now. 
for example, yeah, please. So as you have said, we are still not out of the woods yet with the possibility of a second wave of COVID-19 infection. What should business managers be thinking about right now to improve resilience to future shocks, be it the pandemic, another global financial crisis or a natural catastrophe? Okay. Uh, any immediate uh, and easily seized improvement achieved by IT, automation, and digitization will be implemented. But only those that give immediate results. Uh, that's the attitude. Now, example, uh, blockchain by MERS and DP World able to be implemented rapidly. Uh, this is the concept. This concept is morally ag agnostic. Adoption of e-exchange of information rather than manual documentation or, or using, you know, low, uh, what do you call, uh, salary labor and all that, you know. So rather than manual documentation, uh, we will, uh, you know, the, the, the e-exchange information will be seized upon. Uh, this is happening in uh, South Asia Gateway Terminal in Colombo. So these are the, the technological, you know, advancement and these are, you know, things that uh, uh, most of the technology is doing. Okay. And, yeah, and we, we always adopt to the best technology and cheap and also easy to monitor and to operate. That's all. Mm. I think, um, let me just get back to Dr. Michael and Adzim, right? If there is one silver lining from this COVID-19 pandemic, is that it shows the need for digitalization and optimization as uh, outlined by Dr. Earlier. So, I mean, during this crisis, I'm sure there were a lot of uh, businesses or business managers wishing that you know, they were more connected to the team or they could even talk to the machines and reduce the need for human contact. So to the business owners, Adem and Dr. Michael, how has the pandemic shifted the way you think about technology and how you'll be investing in technology? Let's start with Dr. Michael. Well, basically, I think we sign up almost every type of uh, webinar. We have uh, WeBex, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, what do you call that, um, StreamYard, and this one is a new one that we have not signed up yet uh, for our teleconferencing uh, with uh, Malaysia and our international partners as well. But PKT has been a, a Facebook compulsory company. We always have our, we have been communicating through uh, Facebook all the time time so basically if i if we give an example on the day before uh the lockdown which is on the 17th i basically addressed the whole staff through uh our internal kick ass group uh where every one of them can comment uh, i did a live and then i explained to them what is going to happen our management decision what we're going to do so uh, we have been doing that internally but uh, externally this is the first time we are doing board meetings uh, not really first time as well we have been doing board meetings uh, online board meetings before but uh this time uh, we have all our board meetings online uh, some of the board members who have not used to do that, do that uh, our partners from Japan, uh, Korea, and uh, other places. So uh, it, it has been communicated uh, via... Uh, uh, and as for client, this discussion on pricing, operational issue and everything, we don't see each other anymore. They don't have to fly down from Japan or anywhere because we are doing for uh, global distribution center for some Japanese company. So we are all done uh, via webinar. So uh, uh, they, they will use theirs and we say, oh, uh, ours is better. Maybe we try ours and whatnot. Lah. So PKT had a transformation program. Uh, we call it COVID transformation program uh, somewhere in May uh, where <coughs> we decided because of the impact of the sales went down to zero for automotive for the first time in our history of uh, our business. So we only have the non uh, the essential items uh, uh, sales, which is uh, only about forty percent. So we we tell ourselves we actually need to do some corrective measure immediately. So we decided to do a transformation program via the webinar. So we have one hundred employees, uh, management and uh, second tier management, uh, sitting down in a screen uh, on their weekends, and then we've gone through a transformation. 
So in the transformation, we came up with a new vision. Um, uh, and uh, that visions, I think uh, there is a slide for that, that new vision. We call it uh, Wawasan uh, V50 or Vaccine 50. <coughs> so if we were to take vaccine from the COVID-19, so we need to come up with more non-essential uh, uh, um, uh, items by 50% sales uh, uh, compared to automotive. So automotive and non-auto now have to be 50-50 already. It cannot be 60-40. <coughs> so when 50 was, uh, was initiated, so we try to come up with a lot of items that is recession or COVID proof. And from this uh, uh, COVID uh, crisis, we could see certain businesses that still sustain, especially for f and uh, I think uh, a lot of them went from uh, offline to online sales as well. And uh, we came up with another uh, vision called uh, this uh, Digital 20. So we already actually transforming our business into online business. PKT is not a, just a normal logistics company. Actually, we keep on moving up our value chain. We went, went into 4PL procurement service on behalf of our client. So we started a platform uh, where we sell auto parts online on behalf of our client. So we create a platform for selling spare parts and our client will put their spare parts online uh, in our mm. platform and sell to the dealers and uh, stockists and uh, workshops. So we already started doing that. So this time we decided we're going to have a full uh, go all out investing into this platform to make sure that we have uh, things to sell even though uh, during the COVID uh, crisis. Uh, another virus uh, is, is coming uh, to the world or, or Malaysia. So uh, Digital 20 was uh, created. Uh, inside Digital 20, there are so many things. We want to work with uh, Ninja. We want to be their hub uh, in uh, Penang, uh, where we have our big warehouses. Uh, we don't want to go into Korea business because they are, the market is so many players already. Uh, I saw the search uh, at the moment. The, there's another new China player coming in. New China player coming in. Uh, Best Express. Uh, I think Ninja had to watch out a bit. Best Express is here. Uh, we already have uh, another China player, JNT, here already. Um, uh, and then Best Express Ninja is also one of them uh, from Singapore, right? So there will be a, a huge influx of a Korean player coming into this market because this is the, the at the moment we call it a super normal profit. Everyone want to get a big chunk of Korea profits because the volume is so high. Uh, but then again, um, Digital 20, we are looking in another way. Probably we call it uh, uh, we call it net network uh, delivery. Say for example, every township we have one uncle house, which uh, he's not doing anything. He retire, and then he become our network. So we drop all the parcel to his house at night. This uncle will take this parcel, wear our jacket, and then deliver to the houses. So this is uh, maybe maybe a new method of us uh, sharing the excess capacity or no jobs you know there are a lot of people no jobs so we need to create jobs for them so they can become our our partners as well that's very interesting thanks for uh sharing that <coughs> now i'd like to go to Adzim, right uh, to talk a bit about uh shifting consumer behaviors and the response from retailers and uh, logistics provider so with the lockdowns uh, <coughs> so challenge of moving packages from point a to point B, that pain point has been reduced considerably, right? But the challenges right now, I think, is mostly in uh, the changing consumer behavior. They want, they expect, right, uh, contactless deliveries, uh, contactless payment, and ensuring quick turnaround time. Same day delivery is almost expected right now. And I think Ninja Van is uh, really trying to push into that area. So if you could uh, share with us, uh, Azim, the changes that you are noticing in consumer behavior and how is Ninja Van responding to that? Well, so I think um, uh, speaking on the MCO specifically, right? I think what we saw during the MCO was that uh, it really drove adoption of e-commerce as a whole, right? Because consumers were not allowed to go out and they were stuck at home and you know, retail outlets were closed. Those who were maybe, consumers who were maybe more averse to shopping online before, you know, scared to put in my credit card details, oh, I'm not sure if the parcel will get to me. They were sort of forced to try out the online uh, the online deliveries, uh, the online e-commerce service. And um, and uh, that's what I think was the major shift in uh, e-commerce uh, as a whole during the MCO. And then this together with the fact that uh, 
e-commerce is a growing market in Malaysia, I think there will be a greater demand, not just for faster deliveries and just speedy deliveries, but a wider range of delivery types. So for example, uh, we might move, so right now the, the, the standard in Malaysia is next day, uh, the next standard after that will be same day. But I think as the, the, as the e-commerce market grows, there'll also be a demand for maybe, you know what, I'm ordering this, I might need it only in two weeks time. Can I get a cheaper service for this? I'm not home right now, I might be able to, uh, I, am I able to pick it up from a 7-Eleven instead, right? So we have, you know, forecasted for all these demands and that's actually, well, our main focus this year is to really uh, grow our portfolio delivery services. So we've actually just announced, uh, we've actually working very closely with 7-Eleven, for example, to grow our network of collection points. So instead of uh, getting your parcel delivered uh, to your house where you might not be home, uh, you might be at work or uh, you might, might, might be unable to receive, uh, you can get, uh, through Ninja Vine, you can actually get your parcel delivered to a nearby 7-Eleven and collect it anytime during your leisure. So that's um, that's some one of the things that Ninja Vine's doing to meet the uh, changes in uh, consumer demand. Okay, uh, I think yeah. still on you. Um, yeah. We would also like to talk about, you know, how brands and retailers are finding new ways to connect with shoppers since consumers are, like you said, you know, shopping more online now. Uh, how is Ninja Vine responding to the democratization of e-commerce with the rise of, say, social sellers, um, mom and pop stores going online? How are you reaching up to that? And how actually are you, if a, a Ninja Van is helping them to adapt more quickly to the changes that we're seeing right now? No, absolutely. So we believe that, um, especially the SMEs uh, in Malaysia, they're really, they're really the backbone of the economy and they serve a large part in uh, uh, growing Malaysia's economy as well. So we actually do, um, I mean, we've, we've been in the bit, so we're in six countries uh, and we've been in Malaysia for about five years now. So we actually try our best to give as much support to the SMEs as much as the larger, as much as the larger players. So in fact, um, we, we've got a few success stories. There's a company called Hiladina, um, which is a, a ready to wear Muslim fashion moguls, pair of sisters actually, who we've seen their volume grow 200, uh, about, 20 to 30 times in just, just the past two years. And personally, what I think the best support that we can give these guys is, tell you what, you have, you leave the logistics to us, you focus on what you do best, which is selling, right? On uh, selling your product. And we try to take the hassle out of the logistics as well as the deliveries, uh, such that our, the SMEs can focus on what we believe they do best. Now, on top of that, we also, were quite, we're quite active in the community. We, we partnered up with the likes of Rio, which is a local uh, marketplace bazaar to onboard, to support and to onboard a lot of the local SMEs in the community as well. Okay, I'd like to hone in on last mile delivery, especially because it is, the last mile is really the key to supporting the e-commerce boom and the overall logistics sector. But I understand that the last mile portion is also where the bottleneck tend to happen most, not to mention it's also the most expensive and slowest part of the uh, shipping process. How are we catching up to this pressing need for the last mile to be seamless and efficient as it? Well, so I think uh, in our case, it's really, uh, we, the last mile players really have to work hand in hand together with the large e-commerce players, right? It is, because uh, it has to come, it, it's really a matter of chicken and egg, uh, uh, chicken and egg problem uh, in Malaysia's case at least, right? So Ninja Van might offer same day service, but no, the market might not be ready for it. So um, uh, I believe that we can really drive uh, improvements in the last mile service only by working hand in hand together with the largest e-commerce players in the market. Okay. Now I'd like to bring that to Abdul Raza back into the conversation. Yeah. We will be heading to the question uh, Q&A uh, shortly, but I'd like to just get your thoughts on uh, what are some of the opportunities available to logistics players in the current market? And uh, if you can share with us, what are the trends that we may see in a couple of months with this uncertainty still playing out globally? Okay, as I always say to uh, some of my uh, presentation and all that, um, the new normal uh, exists right in front of our eyes now. We thought that it's going to be uh, uh, quite far from us, but it is seen now. I just want to talk about grab food and funda food. These are also one portion of last mile delivery and uh, but I'm looking at different perspective altogether, 
pardon me of saying this, uh, suddenly, out of sudden, because of the pandemic, the grab food uh, delivery has become an essential service. They, be they became an essential service until today and they become a frontliner, right? Everybody was saying the government also acknowledged that they are frontliners. But what, what do we help them in terms of welfare and all that? I'm sorry, Ninja, uh, you may have, you know, all your, what do you call, uh, uh, your, uh, you know, your, 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 your systems and all that uh, put in place. But if I look at uh, put Panda and, and Grab, every day someone will lie on the road and die. And nobody cares. The company is making a lot of money. But these people uh, are dying. And, and where is the welfare? What happened? If you say they are the frontliners, what are we doing with them? What do we equip them? Do we equip them with the position that we, we recognize them as a frontliner? So, but because of life has to go on, because of young people, you know, they have to find, you know, some kind of uh, income for the for the livelihood and all that, you know, they, they, they brave. Not only the pandemic, they are braving the pandemic, they're also braving, you know, uh, the danger of the traffic accidents and all cars and all that. You see, everybody is dying now every day. Why are we keeping quiet? Why are all these people who are responsible, especially, you know, the, the what do you call, uh, the employer of all this, uh, keeping quiet? Okay. That's all. I understand your point completely. And uh, on this matter, I'd like to go to Dr. Michael too, because the crux of it is really to make logistics and supply chain a professional career choice. And that comes along, comes with the protection, uh, like you've mentioned, you know, have, just to treat our workers better, because this sector has always been tend to tend to be associated with you know, dirty and dangerous, and there is a need to elevate this industry as a whole. That's what Michael Tio, I understand you are actually doing a lot in that area to try to professionalize the sector and make it an enticing uh, career choice, but not just enticing, but a good career choice for young people who want to be in the logistics sector. Well, you know that uh, I think uh, Dato uh, Raza is talking about the, the motor riders and whatnot, uh, but for logistics is very big spectrums. Uh, it's not only uh, motor riders like Ninja Van, they use Van. So, and then for, for us, uh, ours are trucks, uh, big trucks uh, the uh, from one ton, three ton, ten ton, five tons, or twenty tons of trucks as well. So, in terms of uh, professional reasons, uh, I think um, more and more people are aware about the logistics uh, 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 in industry growth uh, in Malaysia. As you know, that uh, of course in this region, the biggest uh, is in Singapore, just down south there. So they are handling about 30 million TUs. Malaysia is handling about 12 million TUs. So with, with 30 million TUs, uh, Singapore is employing about 200,000 uh, employees. And we are 12 million TUs. Uh, roughly about, uh, they, they calculate based on number of freight folders times 24, 25 employee per freight folders. So we are about 50,000 uh, uh, employee. So if we were to increase our number of TUs uh, taking over as a regional uh, hub uh, for transshipment hub and uh, logistics hub. So we will be looking at a movement of uh, 50,000 uh, employees to maybe in the future, 200,000 employees uh, near future. So there is uh, a search in, uh, in uh, uh, education in logistics now, uh, primarily uh, uh, driven by the university side, will be UUM, University of Utara, Malaysia, uh, UMK, uh, uh, even University of Malaysia Pahang. Uh, there is a few uh, university that is already launching their their logistics degree. In terms of polytechnic, Polysas is leading it together with the uh, Polytechnic Sabrang Prai. So they are and also Polytechnic Nilai. They are doing logistics courses. So more and more logisticians are coming up. So then the logistics industry need to do a lot of collaboration with them. Uh, that is for us to teach them what is really what we do we need uh, from uh, these graduates uh, so that they can be 
uh, relevant to the industry when they graduate because uh, we, uh, you see university come up with logistics course but it's very difficult to find logistics lecturers so unless they do a lot of collaboration with the industry which we are doing now the industry uh, academic collaborations to transfer knowledge to them and we give them internship uh, we give them uh, curriculum review and tell them about the uh, digitalization of uh, logistics business and uh, and also more automation is coming up into uh, the region as well so uh, we are looking into even for the truck drivers uh, we actually launched smart trucker program this smart trucker program is basically for young graduates uh, to become a truck driver uh, this is uh, quite uh, unheard for but then you know that truck drivers makes actually four to five thousand ringgit per month uh, but then if only we can uh, ask the graduate why don't you take over this part of the job uh, which earn four to five thousand a month i think we can find a big room of uh, newly new jobs for the new graduates so we create a program called smart tractor program uh, we actually uh, align the six-month internship period with the training program to let them get their license. So by the time they graduate, they finish their internship program for six months, they actually can drive a truck already. So then they sign up our program for four years only. So the smart travel program is only for four years. If you tell them for life, then they will they will be shy away because they say, I don't want to be a lolly driver for life. Uh. Yeah. But we, we don't call it lolly driver, we call it smart truck. This, uh. so we give them lounge we give them very good facility and let them uh, behave uh, professionally uh, in the truck so you can imagine our truck drivers are uh, the one who can uh, speak good english uh, can speak uh, can read and can write as well uh, in the near future so and we also give them uh, good deliveries at the moment uh, so all those uh, family marks delivery to all the family marks are all smart trackers so you can see behind the truck uh, smart tracker program and the guy he is a graduate from polytechnics that just came out you know if you came out from polytechnic you will be getting the pay about thousand eight uh, the most is two thousand but this is four thousand so when they make that kind of money then they may stay in the in the industry and then they become more and we transform our industry to become very professional Whereas for us, for PKT, we are a logistics provider. We are also transforming the, the outlook of the warehouse to become very modern as well and very green as well. So uh, MNC customers are all looking into these kind of factors. Are you green? Are you socially responsible? So we create a lot of social responsible program like the Abit, Ana Blaja, Ibu Bekerja to allow the housewife to come back to work with us in the logistics industry instead of employing foreign worker so we have a lot of foreign worker issue and most of the warehouse if you attend you go for a walk and you will see that a lot of them are all foreign workers so we have not given the opportunity for the housewife to work but in japan if you go and visit their warehouse all are housewife working inside there so maybe only about uh 10 percent are full-time staff the rest all of them are housewife working inside the, the warehouse so that is creating second income in the family and we just launched uh the the uh, uh this uh, uh john bukaja summit Blaja. so that is to allow students to work in the warehouse as well while they are studying their diploma or their degree in logistics as well so to gain experience and then we know who are they and then we are able to get them as our employee so that is for us to scale our business as well and this uh, student will come up uh, graduating with work experience in pkt logistics and with a cv and their diploma they actually can get their job as well so that is a multiple way of uh, changing transforming the logistics industry and from the last uh, uh, government we came up with uh, wabasan kemakmuran uh, raya bersama 2030 and you can see out the 15 uh, key result area growth area there are five of them related to logistics border logistics port logistics and uh, whatnot uh, so fmb and all not so we are positioning malaysia to take over from our neighboring country so we need to have a lot of logistics so logistics is a big industry in malaysia for the next uh, 10 to 20 years that's very ambitious uh plans you have that to michael now quickly i'd say before we go to the q and a uh we know that a lot of um, youngsters, especially, they know to take up jobs as writers and delivery uh, providers as a second job. And often they are the most at risk and they are, in fact, well, frontliners dealing with customers. Uh, what are some of the uh, measures taken to 
protect your staff and how, how are you seeing the changes in terms of uh, employment pre-COVID and post-COVID? If you can share with us your experience. So, uh, so here in Japan, I mean, the safety of our employees is uh, it's all it's 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 paramount to us right so during the covid period uh, and even now actually it was very important for us to employ the social distancing measures and the contact deliveries not just to protect the consumers themselves but also to protect uh, the, our our own staff from the consumers then on top of that we uh, we we found it you know it was a great challenge for us to source and procure um, face masks that uh, disposable face masks for thousands of drivers on a daily basis, as well as hand sanitizers, hand sanitizers, as well as shifting working hours to ensure minimal contact between our staffs. But uh, it was challenging, but we managed to do it, and we thought that it was an uh, absolute necessity. Uh, then with regards to employment during uh, pre and post COVID, uh, I would say that um, at this point in time, that there's, there is a lot of focus on the delivery, uh, on the past of career service uh, industry. So we, we have seen some additional interest uh, with regards to employment for our industry. Uh, I mean, I can't speak on Grab Food and Food Panda, but uh, on the on the parcel delivery side, there's definitely been additional interest. Okay. Now, thank you, gentlemen, for sharing your thoughts. We have quite a number of questions coming in from our participants, so I'd like to get straight into these questions. The first question is for Azim, Min The question Hi. is, uh, the question is from YY. Uh, he, she asked if, how did Ninja Van balance the cost sheet of increased consumer demand and increased cost infrastructure? How did Ninja Van balance the cost sheet of increased consumer demand and increased cost structure? Oh, I see. So, um, so I think what's normally what what people would normally think, hey, Ninja Van, your your parcel deliveries have increased two to three x during MCO, and that means that business is doing great. But actually, what we saw is that there was a disproportionate increase in the costs as well. For example, deliveries to East Malaysia. Um, most of the deliveries done by courier services to East Malaysia go through passenger planes. And as we all know, the flights went down to zero in a, in overnight. And this uh, continued over the next three months. So even though there was an increase in revenue due to the increase uh, in the parcel deliveries, there was also a disproportionate increase in the costs as well. So um, that's, that's how, I mean, it wasn't easy to balance, but we've managed to find a way. Okay. Well, next question is from Shaza On, if you can put the slide up. May I ask if there have been specific essential new skills, digital skills that the industry has identified as necessary for workers in this sector? And are there predictions for the labor market within this sector? I'd like to get to Dr. Michael on your thoughts. Okay, if if, uh, if there's any specific essential new skill, uh, digital skills, well, uh, for the logistics um, employees, um, not really, but uh, in terms of uh, for logistics player like us, yes, a new skill in terms of new way we innovate how we do our fulfillment. Now, PKD also have uh, e-commerce uh, business, uh, but we are more on a fulfillment, fulfillment center we, where our customer actually uh, drop their cargo in our warehouse uh, and then uh, they sell online and then once they sell something they, they will send us information we will pick and pack and deliver for them so the last time is they used to do the the fulfillment direct from overseas into malaysia so now if you buy online during e-commerce season you will buy those items that is coming from china where they are disrupted there's no flight coming in so they you cannot get your items Okay, so now the new method is they will do drop ship. So manufacturer will start to produce items and send it to Malaysia first and keep in our warehouse. Okay, and then when they sell online, that is where we pick and pack and deliver for them uh, to their uh, to their customer. So this is the new uh, method. Uh, more and more customers, uh, manufacturers, due to the COVID nineteen, they couldn't supply buyer overseas. So now they change the method of supply by drop ship. So they produce a lot of stock and they send it to Malaysia and uh, and then drop it in our warehouse and wait until people buy online and we deliver the next day uh, to the customers. So this is the new method uh, of uh, um, doing my business. Uh, in terms of, uh, and what are the prediction for the labor market in this sector? I already told you just now, 150,000 we are looking for the next 10 years. 
So if Malaysia to take over our our, uh, uh, our neighboring country as a, a global transhuman hub, uh, there will be a big surge in the number. Until today, if you can imagine, our numbers for transhuman has never stopped. Uh, he keep on increasing. This is a record number of 12 million TUs. And they are still building ports, uh, extending the ports. So we are going to become a, a new uh, transhuman hub for the hinterland. That means the Indochina from Myanmar, uh, Thailand, everything will bring down to Malaysia and export from Malaysia outbound as well. And thanks to our uh, Asia, uh, which also connect us with the sea as well, and air, sorry, air as well. So land, sea and air, Malaysia is a very good location to be the next ASEAN uh, logistics hub. Okay, thank you, Dato. Uh, still on the uh, question about, um, sorry, give me a second. Okay, I'd like to get to Dato now talking about new breed of logistics uh, practitioner, right? What are some of the traits you think is required when it comes to the skills uh, of being in this industry? Dato, your mic. Dato, can you hear me? We have a question from Azam Din. His question is that COVID-19 has showed that we require a new breed of logistics protection, logistics practitioner, right? So in your opinion, Dato, uh, what are the traits required? Hmm. First and foremost, uh, as a logistic practitioner, uh, uh, we, we are responsible in uh, in uh, giving them uh, training and skill. Uh, and we are now even in the process of uh, looking at uh, the curriculums of uh, our pro professional qualifying uh, certificate for Malaysia in line with the international. And at the moment, we accredited uh, 28 universities, uh, local and public, and they are all now uh, actively uh, what we call teaching uh, our young people uh, uh, to be the uh, professional logisticians and, and transporters. You know? And some of the uh, universities uh, like USM, UMK, uh, you know, UMT, UNIKL, UCSI, to name some of the private universities uh, and also uh, all polytechnics yeah, in the country. And uh, we, we, we are from time to time, uh, we are looking at uh, what are improvements should be done. And uh, we found that uh, technological advancements have to be put in. Uh, destructive technology has to be introduced. Now people are no more um, having about what, 14, uh, what do you call, uh, sheets of uh, documents for shipping. We can do it with only one page of uh, documentation and all that, and, and that's about all. And that will cut the cost of forwarding and shipping to even up to 50%. But of course, it is destructive to the forwarding agent where they, they are relying on, 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 on that uh, kind of business, you know, to feed their family. Well, uh, we are looking to that. and and. Technology-led business model replacing cost-driven focus nowadays. Okay, urgent need to reduce dependent, uh, dependency on physical labor. We are we are even looking at uh, whether uh, we want to have a cross transportation in logistics because uh, many thousands of kilometers transporting logistics will also detrimental to the environment. So we are looking at uh, how. Uh, local sourcing supplies and changing of the supply chain, uh, what you call pattern, uh, to be introduced. Uh, there are a lot of things, and COVID-19 has accelerated, you know, uh, the requirements to do that. So, uh, in logistics uh, and transport, it is now 90% technology. Mm -hmm. It, it was not the, the day when you remember a Steve Dawes you know, carrying on their shoulder, you know, carrying things and all that. Now all online, everything is computerized and digitization. So, so, so we are there on top of it. And uh, for instance, I give you one good example. 
the moment pandemic, the MCO was being, uh, what do you call, imposed. I have got 36 countries uh, under uh, CRT International. So what shall we do? The first thing is we set up communication. That is the only way for us to communicate. Because as a leader, if you just keep quiet and doing nothing, then your follower will say, oh, perhaps they are sleeping. So communication is the most important thing. Physically, you cannot meet, but virtually, you are always, you know, contact. So again, here, technology has drive us very far. But remember one thing, while we are so avaricious and so excited to go to a normal way, because that's where the big money is, remember, today we are enjoying a nice sky because there are not much aeroplane flying. But people definitely want to open the opportunity to fly as many planes as possible to carry millions of people across the world. And you can see that six months of our Earth enjoying the green environment, uh, we tend to forget that whatever effort that we want to do by 2050, we want to have zero co uh, percent uh, you know, carbon emission. I, 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 I'm afraid. That will be, you know, another, another I want to stay on that point because we have a question about that. But before that, I just like to let our participants know that we'll be extending this discussion for another 10 minutes because we've been getting quite a number of questions in. So my next question is actually on the topic of staying green, right? This question is from Said Bradino Omar. He, his question is, are logistics companies doing enough to ensure sustainability through the introduction of newer and greener technology? Okay. I'll answer this question uh, to perhaps. Uh, uh, all right. Uh, this, this, uh, Dato, do you want to answer this? Take this question. Yeah, just a little bit. Just, okay. uh, just to, uh, uh, this is our one of our five focus areas uh, that the CLT is looking at. Uh, 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 green technology and sustainability with good uh, environmental, you know, uh, uh, condition. We are doing it. Uh, nothing else but for the sake of the future generation. And we are following closely, you know, the regimes that uh, that uh, being uh, put up uh, by the United Nations, UNESCO, and all that, and to see that you know we are achieving towards that. We we are not the doer, but we are the one that uh, we feel that we are the one who should monitor things, you know, and make sure that we impart knowledge to you know our future logisticians and all that. Yeah. But we are not a doer, okay? Uh, we are just only an NGO and all that, but we say things uh, wherever possible for us to say, wherever we have opportunity to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dato. Adim, do you think uh, uh, companies, uh, log players in the logistics industry are doing enough to ensure sustainability in, in the supply chain? Well, so, I mean, I can't speak for the other players in the market, but here in Nigerian, we're always looking at uh, ways of optimizing delivery routes as well as delivery services. So so one example is, um, so I mean, we're a tech company first, so we have an algorithm. And the, what the algorithm does is it actually optimizes delivery routes to also minimize fuel consumption, which ultimately, once you hit a certain scale, you know, it has a huge impact on the environment. On top of that, we're also looking to, as I said earlier, we're working to work with partners with the likes of 7-Eleven uh, and, um, and other partners too. Uh, to come up with collection points, which will act as consolidation points for parcels. So instead of going to drive to 10 different um, uh, houses in Bangsa, for example, we drop the 10 parcels in one location in Bangsa and have, uh, which is, which should be within walking distance of the customers and they walk to the point instead. So, on, and uh, this is actually some of the ways that we actually use technology to drive down emissions. Dr. Michael? Well, uh, uh, Cynthia, the basically all depends on the customer's needs. So who is your target customers? Uh, for example, ours is uh, manufacturers, uh, MNC, multinational uh, manufacturers. So all these multi multinational manufacturers, they have these certain guidelines that they want their service provider to adhere to. So sustainability, environmentally friendly warehouses, all these things are very important to them. So PKT uh, embark on our journey towards the direction we want to focus uh, on FMCG. Most of the FMCG customers are actually multinational.
of multinational. So in order for us to get business from them, we need to embark into a lot of um, uh, CSR program, including environment where we build a lot of green warehouses. So our warehouse, uh, every uh, every one of our warehouse move out from our first generation warehouse, second generation green warehouse, third generation and fourth generation warehouse. Uh, for the fourth generation warehouse in Penang, which is the 12th wave, uh, we have solar panels, car park, and then we have a very green, uh, uh, I mean, very bright warehouse where we do a lot of translucent louvers and uh, translucent sheets on the top of the roof to make sure that natural lighting coming to and as well as ventilation as well. And we also have our own green lung, which is a Japanese garden, which we're going to launch this weekend uh, inside the warehouse. This is a pretty unusual things that we are doing. That is for us to engage with the community, allow them to use the Japanese garden. Um, the, and in terms of our trucks, we already uh, keep on uh, investing into technology to monitor the trucks to make sure that they switch off their uh, their engine once they are waiting for loading, uh, not more than 30 minutes. They cannot. Once you reach 30 minutes, uh, your trucks uh, uh, logo will change to blue and then they will highlight to our management guys. And these people will call them, hey, you are now more than 30 minutes. You are not allowed to be more than 30 minutes uh, waiting uh, with the engine on, you know, when not moving. So uh, the, the, uh, the things that we already put in place, uh, of course, the routes, uh, the routes, uh, like what Ninja went explained is, uh, is already in place is very important so that we don't waste fuel. Of course, the other thing is the investment into the technology, like forklift. We don't use uh, the diesel forklift anymore. We only use uh, electric forklift. Uh, but only trucks, uh, their availability in the, in the market is very uh, uh, low where there's not many uh, electric trucks yet. Even hybrid, we still don't have. But if the government uh, uh, allows uh, uh, more charging station to come out and then, uh, then the truck makers start coming out with electric trucks, I'm sure we will invest into uh, that kind of uh, equipments and technologies as well. Yeah. Sure. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, we just have about five minutes left and I'd like to take a couple more questions if I can. Uh, sorry to rush things through a bit. Well, one question is from KK Lee. It's about the logistics profession. How do you encourage youngsters to take up the logistics profession, bearing in mind that this job is time consuming? You have to well, frequently work through Sundays and holidays. So perhaps uh, let's get that to Michael on this. No, no, that is the wrong perception. It's not really uh, well time consuming. Of course, we have different batch of people working on the weekends, of course, uh, and the weekdays as well. But uh, I think the, the attraction here is the money, the jobs. The, 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 when you graduate, you have a cert, you don't have a job. That is a big problem. So now uh, our government is trying to resolve a lot of issues with those graduate who don't have a job. Uh, say, for example, chemical engineering. Uh, for oil and gas industry, but the oil and gas industry is really very bad at the moment. So they need to come to the logistics industry where we are, uh, have more jobs. So uh, I would say that uh, for the motivation for the youngsters at the moment, if you are looking for uh, to make sure that after you graduate, you have a job, go into the logistics industry because logistics industry are not paying uh, uh, the uh, low money. So uh, our C's level are making five figures, our C's level, our GM already five, five figures as well. So uh, they are well paid uh, uh, industry. And not only that, if you don't get a job in Malaysia, I tell you honestly, Singapore will hunt you, uh, hunt, hey, hunt you down and bring you to Singapore because there are, there are plenty of jobs in Singapore, our neighboring country as well. So uh, logistic industry is the new <coughs> job uh, creation uh, in, in Malaysia. Uh, and not only in uh, lo uh, driving lorries, uh, that is the wrong perception again. They are also warehouse operation as well, where we manage operation. And just now the earlier questions talking about what traits of people should, uh, should uh, go into logistics. Engineers, industrial engineers, we are now looking for industrial engineers to become a logistician. Because why now we are doing automation. If you have full automation in, the, in, in, your, in your warehouse, you do not need uh, the, the people who know only logistics. You need somebody who know how to do programming as well. Programming the, 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 the software, you need the programmers, you need also the industrial engineer to, to make sure your conveyor system, your uh, robotic system don't shut down. 
So I, I was talking to uh, UMP uh, uh, last week. Uh, UMP have also decided to have a major in engineering, a minor in logistics, So uh, which uh, allows the cross breed so that the people that graduate in, in, in engineering can get a job in a logistics industry uh, in the near future. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, going on to this. Yeah. Okay, just to continue on that, to ensure continuous supply of talent in the pipeline for Ninja Vent, right? For youngsters wanting to take up a job in the logistics industry in the last mile uh, space, they don't just want a job that will end up, you know, just setting parcels for the next five years. Or what kind of plans, or if there is there any plan within Ninja Vent to help uh, people joining the company in terms of career progression and to move on to a greater role? Oh, absolutely. So, um, so the thing with Ninjavan is, so I think we what we try to do as a company is we try to put we try to put our perspective on logistics and logistics has been logistics is not a new industry it's been around for hundreds of years right the movement of parcels from point A to B is really it's a it's an age old process so what we've done is in uh, in Ninjavan we are tech first and actually most of us and most of the founders don't actually have any formal training in logistics itself but what we, what uh, what we've done instead is we've used data and we've built the technological products um, to help transform logistics towards, you know, uh, so that it's a lot more catered towards uh, the more current demands, I would say. So it makes us a lot more nimble to adapt to new needs and, you know, uh, uh, requirements from the market. Uh, for, for example, how we've managed to pivot so quickly during uh, the MCO and the COVID period. So, um, and then to go back to the point <coughs> that, um, how do you convince young people to work in logistics? So I think logistics in this day and age, it's it's changed a lot, right? It's not your, um, it's not what it was 20 years ago. And logistics, every logistics company will have lots of different disciplines under it. For example, every company will have sales, every company will have HR. But I think that the way logistics moving uh, is moving nowadays, uh, the need for data management, analytics, robotics ex expertise, as well as to some extent uh, development and engineering. Uh, engineering development, like full stack developers and coders and programmers. I think um, these traits will become more and more required in the logistics industry going forward. All right. Okay, yeah. uh, that's all the time that we have, unfortunately. But thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. Of course, we can continue uh, this discussion on social media, Facebook and Twitter. And uh, just to uh, let you know that this webinar series is happening um, every two weeks, um, and in two weeks' time, we actually have another uh, webinar that we'll be talking about the impending end of the moratorium and how should people prepare for it. That's coming up in two weeks. And once again, I'd like to thank all of you, Dr. Michael, Dr. Abiraza, and Azim, for joining us on this discussion. You've been watching the new normal series by Astro Awani. Thank you. Thank you to all our participants. And we hope to see you again in our next webinar. Sure. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.